grab your Bibles, open them up to Ephesians, the second chapter. We bring our last teaching in the One Another series to a close as we're getting ready to start When Pigs Fly. Excited about that series. Question I have for you today is, um, are you... You know, the, the scripture, I guess the question I would say is this, I would ask is like, has this last series changed anything about me? The last thing we want to be are hearers of the word and not doers. Let me tell you how that happens. That happens by coming and sitting in a comfy chair in an air-conditioned room with your cappuccino and your donut and your Bible open or your sermon outline going. But you do not have. You've never applied anything that we've taught. So over the last six weeks, we have been talking about the one and others of the New Testament. And when you think about that, the one and others of the New Testament, you, um, you think about pray together encourage one another, uh, bear one another's burdens. You think, uh, as we, we've taught, like this whole series began with people will know you by the way you love one another, right? And so we don't want to be just coming and being entertained. We don't want to be just coming and, and listening to a message. We want to put that in practice. So um, how are you doing? Who have you encouraged? Last six weeks, who have you encouraged? Who have you prayed with? You know, we talked about serving one another. So if you never served in our church, 200 and some odd volunteers serving, and if you've never served in your church, where did you sign up to serve? Now, we don't want to be doers of the word, or excuse me, hearers of the word only. We want to be doers, right? It can happen so easy. It can happen so easy to come in this room, listen to a message, and, and feel like, oh, I should do that and then walk out. That's not what we're here to do today. You came here today to meet with God. You came here today to be changed. And, and I'm pretty certain that today's sermon is going to challenge you. But here's the deal. To be challenged is cool, but it's not everything. To be changed, to be transformed, that's why we ought to be here today. And so, so we can't go about just ignoring the second most common phrase in the New Testament, can we? Second most common phrase in the New Testament are the one and others, right? It says one another over a hundred times in the New Testament alone. It's second only to the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, which means this is something we can't ignore. You know, in, I don't know what your church experience has been, but, you know, I've been, I'm 53 I have, um, this church has been here 20 years last month, 20 years. Angie and I and about 38 other people began this church. Yeah, we've been here 20 years. That's pretty awesome. But the reality is, is like in those 20 years, I'm going to share some experiences that I had with you uh, because today we're talking about bearing with one another. Um, and here's the reality. We don't do that well in church. I don't know if that's been your experience, but my experience in any church that I've been a part of is that, that they tend to ignore the one another passages and they don't do this well. And so um, if I think about historically, this just isn't a Southern Illinois thing. This isn't just a church in America thing. This is church since the beginning. Churches since the beginning have always had struggles. Paul knew that. He wrote to the church in Jerusalem. Like he literally went there and confronted Peter because there was an issue going on. And it wasn't that they were just terrible people. It was an issue that had been ingrained in them. Culture, their culture was a culture that said, oh, I'm Jewish. I don't need to have anything to do with Gentiles. And so, you know, the church in Jerusalem struggled with racism right out of the gate. The church in Ephesus, they struggled with brotherly love. The church in Galatia, they struggled with teaching. They had people called Judaizers who would come in, and not only were they worried about you being Christian, they wanted to add the religious to-do list right next to that. So a Judaizer would say, oh, you need to believe in Jesus, yes, but then you also need to worship on the Sabbath on this one day. Or you need to eat this certain food, eat kosher, you need to do that. Or, hey, by the way, you need to be circumcised too if you're a male, 
right? They were, they were giving you the religious list to try to make you a Jewish Christian instead of a Christian only. And so in Corinth, boy, did they have their struggles. Corinth, I'll just list one of them because we may have younger viewers. I mean, they had some real issues, but, but the reality is in Corinth, they struggled to follow what leader they were going to follow. You had Paul, you had Apollos, and you had Jesus, right? And they're like, well, I follow Paul. Well, I follow Apollos. Well, I just follow what Jesus wrote in the scriptures. I'm just good there. Churches always had problems. Philippi, they struggled with disunity among members. In all of the churches in the New Testament, though, there was one common thing, and that's they worked it out. They worked out their differences. You know, the, that's not a trait I find today very common. It's too easy to leave. It's too easy to go just to a different church. Did you know from this building, there are 47 other Southern Baptist churches, unless some of them are closed since the last time I looked, 47 Southern Baptist churches. You can get offended at somebody you're sitting next to and just go find one other congregation somewhere else. So maybe proximity had something to do with why they worked it out. Or maybe they simply took what the Word said and they put it into practice and they became being doers of the Word instead of hearers only, right? And so, so today I, I want to share a graphic with you. I want to share a statistic with you that blew me away. I read this uh, study last week. And it says that 66% of Christians will leave their church offended at least one time in their life. They'll leave a church offended by someone's words or someone's actions. Now, the 66% is represented in those who are represented in the black. And then, uh, and yes, there are 100. This is an accurate. So there are 66 people in this represented in black. And then 34 are represented in the red. Now, understand this, that you have a decision to make today. When someone in this congregation offends you, what team are you going to be on? The team that says, I'm done with this church, and I'm going to go somewhere else? You, good luck with that, because you know what's going to happen? You're going to go there, and somebody else is going to offend you. And then you're going to leave that church, and somebody else is going to offend you. Because none of us are perfect. This church are not perfect. We aren't perfect. I'm not perfect as a pastor. You're not perfect as a believer. It's not going to happen until we get to heaven. And if you want to leave heaven, ugh, your options are pretty limited, right? Heaven or hell. So, so I think you better hang with the Christians today, right? But think about this, that I would leave my church over an offense, over a word that's spoken or an action that's done. And I'm not even talking about done by the preacher. I'm talking about done by one another done to one another. Do you know it, that people are more likely to talk to their little league coach about their kid playing time? They don't just bail on that team and leave. They're more likely to talk to a coach than they are to talk to another Christian. You know, and I think that comes from this individualistic culture that we live in. We live in a culture that teaches us that this world is all about ourself. And so when we're saved and we come into the family of God, we have to now learn that, that we do our, have a responsibility to the body, and that is to bear with one another. I'm not talking about burdens. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Somebody gets an issue, you bear, you, their troubles are your troubles, their struggles are your struggles, you help them out. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about tolerating, putting up with another believer, somebody sitting in front of you, sitting behind you, sitting beside you. Heck, maybe they're, they're married to you and you got a ring on your finger saying, I'm with them forever, right? The, the reality is it's like, it's like we have to be here for one another. Why? Because the Scripture commands us to bear with one another. And I do think that you want to make this your last church. I believe that. I believe that. I believe you're here with the sincere... Um, motives and that you want to make this church, but you have to do something to prepare yourself for that. It doesn't just happen. So, so let's jump into Philippians. Let's look at what Jesus did. He uh, is a perfect model to follow, and, and let's see what he did, because I think we want to cultivate a heart that allows us to bear with one another, tolerate, put up, love one another in the midst of all of our struggles. Philippians 2, we're going to read three verses starting at verse 5. Will you guys give me an amen when you're ready and we'll dive right in. Here we go. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he what? He emptied himself 
by taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of man, look at verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I believe that if we're going to truly bear with one another, we are going to have, I believe that starts with humility. That we have to put on humility like you put on your Sunday best. I think you've got to clothe yourself in humility. You know, Jesus, the Bible says that he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant. You know, Jesus, in this emptying process, he chose weakness over strength. He got hungry. He got tired. This is God. He chose. He emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. He chose weakness over strength. He chose a life of servanthood over a life of privilege. He chose pain over comfort. And he chose death over life. Even though he was God, he chose that. He humbled himself even to the point of death. I believe that bearing with one another requires humility. I think that's where it begins. I think that when you're so busy thinking that life is about you, you'll come to church and you'll try to make it about you. It'll be about the temperature of the room. It'll be about the cushion seat. It'll be about a music style. It'll be about an attire. It'll be about coffee and donuts. It'll be about this and it'll be about that. And you're one offense away from joining Team 66. 66% of Christians at some point in their life will leave a church upset over an action, over a word. Not wrong teaching. Not a false doctrine. Not the things that you should leave a church over, right? You leave because if somebody said something, somebody did something, you'll have your seat, you'll have your chair, you'll have your church, and it'll only be your church until someone offends you. Regardless of what you do, you've got to put on humility. There's a lesson that I have learned over the years as being a pastor. Um, if I roll the clock back to, so as I said earlier, this church has been here for 20 years. Uh, if I roll the clock, b- clock back to 21 years, Angie and I board a plane. We go to Venezuela. We do some uh, mission trip in the Andes Mountains. I think it's a 13-day mission trip, 10 or 13 days, and we're over in the Andes Mountains, mountains going street to street, doing evangelism, house to house, street preaching in the evening. And, um, and it's a different world there. But preparing for this trip, we went to our doctor and we said, oh, we're leaving. We're going out of town. The doctor prescribed Angie a antibiotic. That antibiotic was so that if you get over there, because you're going to eat food that's over there, I tell you, when you're selective like me, whoo, that food is something, right? You got to get over that, right? But when they call me picky when it comes to food, but I like to say I'm selective, right? Only the best. So, so anyway, all that to say that the doctor said it'd be good for you to have an antibiotic. And instead of prescribing both of you an antibiotic and you buying the prescription, I'm just going to prescribe more pills in the bottle and you guys can share them. Not a problem. And that was our family doctor. No problem. We get over there and we get on the trip and the trip goes well until it doesn't. And, and that really doesn't really have a lot to do with many people on the team. It has more to do with the person who's leading the team. And there's just something about him. I can't put my finger on him. And I'm like, there's something wrong with this dude. And then his true color showed himself. He was about money, not about the mission. And so he made it his mission to get more money from the trip. It was this big, long story to say it wasn't going to work out. When we came back, I shared with our pastor what was going on. I said, this is what happened. This is what's going on. We need to not do another mission trip with this guy. And... For people who had went, you know, half a dozen times or maybe even a dozen times, they were very vested in that friendship, and they overlooked a lot of things. And after six months of reasoning with these folks of why we decided we were never going to do this mission trip with this guy again, who just as a side note, a year later, turned out that he had taken up offerings, and those offerings never arrived back to their destination. They just arrived in his pocket we were right about him, people in our own church wouldn't listen to that. And so they began to spread lies. 
One of the lies they told about me is that I was, I, I took illegal drugs. I don't drink alcohol. Since I've been saved, I don't drink alcohol. I have never in my life done marijuana, done any illegal drug. But that was the lie they told about me. That was a hard lie to hear when I first heard it. This is 21 years ago. That's a hard lie to, to hear. But here's one thing that I learned. If you're going to be a believer and follow Jesus, you better develop some thick skin because people say some of the stupidest things in church. They'll say it about me. They'll say it about you. I wasn't, I wasn't the pastor yet, right? And we, we had plans on planning this church and starting this church, but we hadn't done that yet. People will lie about you. And you know, when you put on humility and you say they lied about Jesus, they lied about Jesus. How did Jesus overcome those lies? He clothed himself in humility. And he calls us to put on humility just like him, to empty ourselves of our, our pride and our, our value and our self-esteem, uh, not self-esteem, our, our self-worth, to clothe ourselves in humility. And when you do that, guess what? You're able to forgive those folks and bear with them. But you're not able to do that if you think a lot about yourself. You know, I'm going to love you just as your pastor and as another believer. And, and let's, let's leave the pastor card alone and just talk about a believer where we're all at. I'm going to love you even when you don't love me and forgive me, right? I'm going to love you when you don't do those things. I have people all over. And I, there was a guy added to our prayer list just the other day. I saw his name and I text somebody and said, is this so-and-so? Because they're getting ready to come to their life stage, the end of the stage of their life. And I'm like, is this, is this so-and-so? And then the person said, yeah, this is them. They had requested prayer. And I said, oh, well, let me pray for them. And, and I'm going to reach out to them. Why would you reach out to somebody that wasn't kind to you? Because I don't think too much of myself. I can humble myself like Jesus humbled himself. Jesus cared for people who weren't compassionate and forgiving towards him. You know, here, here's another truth that, you know, Angie and I find out a financial need. If there's a financial need in our church, I don't go and say, hey, Pastor Brett, can you look up somebody's tithing record and see if they give to our church? No, Angie and I are just going to bless you. You could never support our church ever financially. You could be a com complete consumer never contribute, I'll still, I'll still help you. Angie and I will still come to your aid financially when we can. Why? Because I don't think too highly of myself. Jesus humbled himself, I can humble myself. When I, when I think about teaching, and this one really gets me, if, if you want to get my goat, this is the one that really gets me over the years, is I have read this book from cover to cover. I have studied this book from cover to cover for 20 some odd years now, 26, 27 years now. And every now and then someone will say something like, uh, it'll get back to me. Oh yeah, he doesn't know what he's talking about in this area, blah, blah, blah. And they'll say something and they won't ever say it to me. And I will, somebody, somehow it gets back to me and I'll hear that and I'll go, Oh, okay. And so at some point, if I'm having a conversation with them, I might bring that up. Hey, what do you think about this? Well, see, I don't think you're right on this because of this, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, and then I said, where do you see that in the Bible? Well, I, I researched it thoroughly. Oh, you Googled it? Let's open the book. Let's go chapter to chapter. Let's figure it out. I want to help you, right? I'm not trying to show you I'm right and trying to be right. I, I, I just want you to understand clearly, like, Google's not your source. Get in the Word itself. Study something systematically, topically. Dive into the whole thing, right? Don't just take a verse. Let's jump into the whole thing. And, and, and it's like, you say you know more than me and you haven't even read the book. But at the end of the day, when you put on humility, guess what happens? I'm still able to love you. I'm still able to bear with you. Because honestly, in this church, we have so many different backgrounds and so many different beliefs. You have to before we ever get anybody on the same page. You know, there are, uh, there are times when people do decide to leave redemption. And if they're courageous enough just to come tell me, not that you need courage to that, but like if courageous might not be the right word, but I feel like a lot of people just disappear. 
And, but when you do tell me, hey, we're going to leave, and I had a couple tell me this. Uh, several years ago, they told me, and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to go. We really feel called to be somewhere else, and we don't know where that somewhere else is yet. I said, okay. Well, I learned this lesson a long time ago that I'm not so special that people belong to me. They belong to the Lord. They don't belong to me. They don't belong to Rim's church. So <clears throat> when they left, I said, I called him up and said, hey, here's the deal. In six weeks, I'm putting it on my calendar to call you, and I want to make a deal with you. If you haven't found a church home, I'll see you that following Sunday. He goes, what? I go, here's the deal, man. People say they leave and they don't get connected with another church. And when you're all alone, the devil gets you exactly where he wants you. When you're not going to church and you're not a part of church, it's easy to fall through the cracks. It's easy to get back on the broad path. I don't want that for you. Even if you're not coming here and you never come here again, I'm going to call you in six weeks. Okay, they always tell me, okay, six weeks I call. Where are you at? Well, we haven't landed on this home yet. We've visited a couple of places. I said, where are you at this Sunday? Well, we're going to this one church. I said, okay. Now, I'm telling you, this was four or five years ago. And, um, well, his, I went down there. I preached at their church for a little while. I saw them again after the dinner. They're like, hey, you want to go to lunch? I said, sure. I'm going with your pastor, but come along with us. So we go eat. And while we're sitting there, him and his wife are there. And I said, so you're down here at this church. And, yep, awesome. Where are you serving? Well, we haven't started serving. Oh, really? But you've been here for like a year now. But you haven't, well, yeah. And I looked at his wife. Don't you like kids? Yeah, I like kids. Hey, Matt. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Hey, pastor, um, I, want you to, uh, I want you to get them signed up. She's going to start serving kids ministry. Yeah, we'll do that. So they do. I looked at the dude. Don't, aren't you good on the media team? Yeah, so he's serving. A couple of years pass. I get a phone call from his pastor. Hey, have you seen so-and-so? Hmm, I haven't. What's up? Well, they haven't been in church in a while. You're kidding me. No, they haven't been in church. Oh, well, I'll call him. So I call him. He didn't even come to my church. So I call him. He hasn't been here in four or five years. So I call him. He doesn't answer. So I sent him this text last Wednesday. After three phone calls, two voicemails, I sent him this text. Brother, are you, are you doing all right? I haven't heard from you in a while. Not, still, you're not sure you're still attending that church. What's going on with you, brother? Crickets since last Wednesday. You know who I will call when I leave here today? This same gentleman. Why would you care? Why would you do this? Aren't we supposed to bear with one another? But they don't even go to your church. Isn't the church larger than just redemption? See, when you think too highly of yourself individually and even corporately as a church, you're going to fail at bearing with one another. You know, you have to put on humility if you're going to bear with one another. You cannot think a lot about yourself and ever fulfill this command to bear with one another. Bear with one another in love, Ephesians says, trying to keep and maintain the spirit of unity. That's a big deal in the New Testament. Unity in the body of Christ. Uh, there's another thing I think we should do. I think we should not only put on humility, I think we should learn to be patient with one another because sometimes in ministry, we get off base. Sometimes in ministry, we miss the mark. Sometimes in ministry, we can't see the forest for the trees. We lose sight of the objective, which is to love God, love one another, to bear with one another. So let's share. I want, I want to go to Matthew in the 16th chapter. I'd love to read a story in Matthew 16 of when uh, a believer who was following Jesus, and he was close to Jesus when, when he lost sight of the objective, and he did some really foolish things. We're going to start in verse 21. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things that the elders and the chief priests, the scribes, and get this, and be killed, and on the third day be risen from the dead. All right, so let's get this down. You've been with Jesus for three and a half years. You're following him around. And as you're following him around, there comes this point when he's coming to the place where he's ready to surrender his life. And let me tell you what he does, Matt. He starts telling them very plainly. Guys, I've been hitting at this for a while. But really plainly, you need to understand that I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer a lot. They're going to say some things. They're going to put hands on me. 
I'm even going to die. The scribes, the temple guard, they're going to, the Romans, they're going to crucify me. That's what's happening. He's telling them really plainly. But look at verse 22. And Peter took him aside and began to what church? Rebuke him. He began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall what? Never happen to you. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So the one who stepped out of the boat and began to sink in the water is rebuking the one who walked on water. The one who needed daily food to survive is rebuking the one who took, who took a couple fish and a couple loaves and fed thousands in the multitudes, right? Man, fallen man is beginning to rebuke God in the flesh. That's what's happening in this text. I told you, there are times in church where you miss the mark. There are times in church when you get off base. It can happen. It happened with Jesus' followers. It can happen right here in this building with you. <laughs> in this moment, the student is, is rebuking the professor. Think about that. Th this is totally off base, missing the mark, which is why we need to be patient with one another. Because we can be Peter at any given moment. Peter was a dude who rushed to judgment, who was quick to speak, very slow to listen. And that got him in deep water multiple occasions. So how did Jesus practice patience with Peter? Well, Jesus is just like he said. Jesus is crucified. He is nailed to a cross for all to see and... And after he is placed in a tomb three days later, we pick up the story in John. We pick up that story in the 21st chapter. Will you read this with me? John 21, verses uh, 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, this is Jesus risen from the grave with Peter. When they had finished breakfast, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my sheep. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, then tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Look what it says. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, what church? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. There's a place for you in my ministry. You missed the mark. You got off base. You became a hindrance to me at some seasons. You didn't understand it. You didn't get it. I told you plainly. And, and you rebuked me. And then when they came to arrest me, you still tried to stop it. You took out your sword. You chopped off him, Malachi's ear. I had to heal the dude. Then let him drag me off. You didn't get it. And then, and then while I'm being tortured and, and, and uh, interrogated, people come to you in a crowd and they say, aren't you one of his followers? And you say, you don't know me. And then a little bit more time went throughout the evening and you're still at a distance and, and someone sees you and you say, wait a minute, aren't you a Galilean? You're, you, you're one of his followers, aren't you? And you say, no, I don't, I don't know the man. And then, and then you got cold because the morning was coming and you were warming yourself by that fire. And that lady came to you and she said, your speech gives you away. I know you're one of his followers. And instantly you went to cussing and you said, I don't know the beepity beep man. You denied me three times. So three times I'm asking you, Peter, do you love me? If you love me, I got a place for you. He practiced patience. See, patience makes it possible to bear with one another. Do you understand that we have to be patient with one another, church? We have to be humble and we have to be patient with one another. I feel like so many issues in church arise from impatience and how highly we think of ourselves. Final story I want to tell you is from John, and it's in the, the eighth chapter this time, and one of my favorite stories in Scripture. And it, there's so much to learn from this Scripture, but... What we're learning from this text, I believe, is how to bear with one another, the practical ways of bearing with one another. Look in verse 1. It says, 
They went out, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came to the temple. All the people came to him and they sat down and they taught him. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. They said to, um, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commands us to stone such women. What do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and he wrote with his finger on the ground. And they continued to ask him. He stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Um, gave you a stone. When you walked in, it's just a pebble compared to the stone they would have carried in that day. The stone they would have carried in that day would have been 25 plus pounds. And the idea was this woman was caught in a sin. She's offended us. She is sleeping around. She has not been faithful to her husband. She's a bad seed, a bad apple. She'll never change, da, 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 da. They would have drug her out of the city and taken those stones and thrown them down on this woman's chest and her head until she stopped breathing. You have a stone. He said, whoever's among you without sin, cast the first stone. So, so here's what I'm challenging you with today, church. If you're without sin and you just can't make this church your home because you think too highly of yourself, because you won't be patient with one another, go ahead when you leave, go ahead and throw that stone at whoever offends you. Just bring a slingshot if you want. Just cast that first stone if you've never sinned. Because don't you know when people leave church, they don't just leave. They take their parting shots on the way out. Oh, this church is this. This church is that. This church, this pastor is this. This guy is that. They take their shots. Verse 8. And once more, he bent down on the ground. But when, <laughs> but when he bent down on the ground, he rode to the ground. But when they heard what he said... They went away one by one, beginning with the old ones. And Jesus was left the woman standing before him. Jesus said, stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. No one condemned me, Lord. <laughs> no one condemned me, Casey. No one. I was caught in the act of adultery and they haven't condemned me. I was an addict and they haven't condemned me. I was a liar and they haven't condemned me. I, I'm a sinner and I, I didn't love God. I didn't follow him and they didn't condemn me. They accepted me. They welcomed me into their church. They, they, they didn't condemn me. And he looked at her and said, from now on, go and sin no more. When you came in, you, you received a stone and you received a cross. And that is the decision that you have before you in every moment of every day. See, the cross is an example of bearing with one another. Because on the cross, Jesus bore your insults. He bore your lies. He bore your sin. He bore your selfishness, your self-worth. He bore your arrogance and your pride, your individualism. He bore everything that, that you were against him. And on the cross, he took upon your sin and he bore it in his flesh, hanging from a cross. That's what the cross is. That's what the cross is. It's a tool to bear with one another. So today you have a choice to make. You can carry a stone or you can carry a cross, but you can't carry both. You can carry a cross or you can carry a stone, but you can't carry both. Today, the commitment I'm asking you to make is a commitment that says, this is the last church that I'm going to be a part of until Jesus comes back. 
or I go be home with him. That's a big commitment. But it's a scriptural commitment saying that you'll bear with one another because you're going to offend the other. And the other's going to offend you. It's more likely not even going to have anything to do with me, although I'm an equal opportunity offender. I do things sometimes and don't even realize it, right? What about today? Would you make a commitment today? To not think too highly of yourself, but to empty yourself like Jesus did? Would you make a commitment today to put on humility and bear with one another so that you're not on Team 66? Would you make a commitment today to be patient with one another as people are trying to figure out how to sin no more? You got a stone and you got a cross and you can't carry them both. So here's the the ask. In this service right now, I'm going to ask you to throw one of these away. I'm choosing grace over condemnation. What do you choose? When I pray, you make that decision. And then as an act of worship, you come throw your stone right here in this bucket. Or you throw the cross right here in this bucket. Because when you're being condemning and judgmental and you think yourself, think of yourself too highly, you're not representing him well. Father, we love you, and we come to you today asking for discernment of your will, praying, God, that we could be a church that truly learned to bear with one another. God, it's a beautiful thing to know we haven't been condemned and that we've been called to go and sin no more. God, today I ask our church family to not give up on one another, but to truly bear with one another as we are on this journey of holiness. It's in Jesus' name we pray.